Podcast World with Shake and Chad Belding, the Foul Life Podcast. Thank you all so much for all the ratings and reviews, the subscriptions, the downloads. We're very pleased with the numbers. It's humbling to know how many of you are out there listening to it. Hopefully, you all are getting some tips and tactics and stories, something to get fired up for the next day's duck hunt when you get to that boat ramp and put your boat in the water. That's what we're trying to do. We just want you to live with that anticipation of those mallards or specks cupped up, feet down, right in the kill hole, right in the decoy spread. Today, episode is brought to you again by our friends at Gerber Gear. Stay sharp, America. We'd never try to build a blind or cut up a duck, a deer, an elk, a turkey without our Gerber product. They got saws. They got hatchets. They got axes. They have folding knives. They have straight blade knives. They stay sharp. They keep an edge. And obviously, you always want to be safe. But Gerber gets us to the next level when it comes to concealment, hiding, preparation, culinary arts, butchering processing you've seen it so many times here at the foul life of all the wild animals that we love to pursue and harvest and eat and gerber gets us there so to support the partners and sponsors that support us today's guest on the podcast i'm gonna let him tell you what his name is because i think it's john vradenberg and he is the supervisory biologist of the klamath basin complex did i get it right you got it perfect Perfect. Perfect. So supervisory biologist of the Klamath Basin complex. What does that entail? What what defines the complex? Yeah, so the there's six refuges here in the Klamath Basin, six national wildlife refuges. Three of them are in Oregon, three of them are in California. In California we have Clear Lake, Lower Klamath, and Tule Lake National Wildlife Refuge. And in Oregon we have Bear Valley, Upper Klamath, and Klamath Marsh. So it's roughly about 250, 260,000 acres that we're responsible for. And I supervise the program that does all the biological monitoring and habitat management across those six refuges. So you're, you work for the federal government. Yep. And that's why you can cross the state boundary and you're working in Oregon and California, yes, correct? Sir. Yep. Okay. So let's just get right into it about why we're here. We, we were discussing this, you know, a couple months ago, there was a big botulism breakout here. Um, but there's a there's bigger things, you know, that's terrible of what happens, but there's reasons why that's happening. Um, the tourism here is down. The, the, the business is down here. The water is down here. The, the, the Klamath refuge is suffering 1908. It came into existence under Roosevelt. It's the law. It's the the oldest waterfowl refuge in the country, but that's kind of misleading too. If you would, uh, if you agree, John, is because there's so many animals that flourish up here, from shorebirds to mule deer to coyotes to all kinds of mountain lions and predators, and and all kinds of waterfowl. But I don't even know how many species of wildlife there are up here. Do you have any idea? Well, wildlife, I don't know. I just looked up this morning to make sure I was right, but it's about 350 species of birds alone. 350, and then you got all the big game. All the big game. It's crazy, game. right? Yeah. Varmint, you have varmints and you have, I mean, everything down to a field mouse, yeah. um, it, it, it is, is affected when this Klamath refuge is in the state that it is. So is there, uh, do you know why right now we're sitting, it's December of 2020. Thule side looks okay. There's some ducks there, but there's not many ducks. Right. The Klamath, com, you know, the Klamath basin is dry, hundred percent bone dry when that should be lights out right now. Um, what's going on? Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of things going on. That's uh, This place is so complex. It makes it part of the challenge working here. Um, but I think it's important to step back and, you know, what look at what we were at historically. You know, so if we do go 1908 when the refuge was established and, you know, this was four really big lakes, Clear Lake, Lower Klamath, Tule Lake, and Upper Klamath were just a big lakes. But I always like to to find this place as it was a big wetland with some open water in the middle of it. And it was, it was close to 350,000 acres of wetland habitat here across the basin. Um, and over time, that's just, you know, we've lost a lot of that to landscape alteration. Uh, water budgets are changing. Uh, we're changing climatically. We don't know, you know, precipitation has changed. Um, but the land has just changed a lot. And so we're down to I don't remember the exact statistics right now, but um, I mean, we're well below 20% of the historic wetland footprint remains here in the Klamath Basin. So when you look at that historic footprint and then the refuges overlay that, you know, they're, they're that 20% on the landscape anymore. So when they start to go dry, things get 
tight really fast for species that need wetlands. And that's where we're at right now. We've lost all of this wetted habitat and, and the associated values with it, and we're seeing the wildlife starting to suffer. So has this been an ongoing thing for when, – when did you – how long have you been here, and when did you start to see the decline? So I've been here six years. Um, my predecessor before that, Dave Mauser, um, he did his Ph.D. work here, and he started in the basin in the mid-'90s, I believe, is when he took over the refuge, or early-'90s He was as the biologist. And, you know, he, he sort of describes that time period of his career as when that change was really starting to happen. You know, we started to see things shifting in the 90s. Water was getting tighter. Um, in the 2000s, it started to get really tight, early 2000s, with the first water shutdown. You know, when people started to realize that the – the water was getting tight for everything that was happening between the endangered species issues, agriculture, refuges. Um, there was just, things were tight to make it last for everybody. And, you know, we had some periods in there where we did okay. Mid 2000s, the water was doing okay. But by, by 2010, 2011, we got into this pretty long-term protracted drought to where we just haven't come out of it yet. And the refuges haven't rebounded. And, Part of that, you know, if you look at it from a biological perspective is, you know, these are big peat systems. They were lake beds historically. And so they're, they're at their most efficient when they're wet. And so when you dry those soils out, they get extremely dry. Those soils start to crack and it takes that much more water to fill them up. It's like a sponge, you know, when you get a sponge full, it's pretty effective at, you know, it hold, you know, water sits on top of it. But when it's dry, all that water has to go in and fill it up. And that's where we're at now where we get these limited water supplies, but we went dry for so long, we fill up a lot of the soil, but we don't see a lot of surface water showing up out there. And that's just getting progressively worse year after year. And the, the more the more these drought conditions persist, the, the deeper we get into that, that water deficit. So what I've heard is that some things that have affected this is that there's, there's a lot of um, people or animals you mentioned the endangered species but there's a lot of different players that come into effect who need the water want the water demand the water it's from farmers it's the refuge it's the river and the creeks and the uh, commercial salmon fishermen it's the reservation and and the american indians reservations in this area and the tribes and um you you already did like i said before mention the endangered species i think it one's a sucker fish or something's in in that ball game but when you have all of those people you know that want the water all those different entities that need the water and demand the water it's is that what's going on is that nobody really wants to play fair and this the refuge is what's suffering or, or is the salmon fishing suffering are the are the tribes suffering um i see it up here uh tule lake the town of tule lake the town of klamath business is suffering for sure because hunting is a huge revenue driver this time of year um this town of merrill the town of tule lake it doesn't even look the same as it did at one time is that fair to say yeah i think that's fair to say i mean the economy is definitely been affected by the loss of outdoor recreation. Um, and I think all the stakeholders you mentioned, I mean, they, everybody has skin in the game, you know, which I think is important to remember. And it's, you know, for us working on the refuge, you know, we, ha we have to look across that stakeholder landscape and see who's involved, how are they affected? What, what, what's their tie into this? And, you know, the, you know, I think you, you hit it on the head. It's complex. There's a lot of people that have a lot of water has been allocated across the board to people, you know, whether that was, um, you know, the time immemorial rights for the Native Americans, the project allocations that came for agricultural production. Um, but when it comes to the refuge, our water situation sits a little bit differently. You know, we're at the bottom end of the system. And when the refuge was established, the way they defined water rights was really different back then as well. You know, it was a big lake when it was established. And so our water right portfolio is a lot different um, than the other stakeholders out there. So there's a, it's a really complex background that would take, you know, multiple podcasts to work through all of that. But I think it's fair to say that it's really complex because so many people are really invested and their investment is directly tied to the water and water is changing now. I mean, we're seeing 
snowpack in the Cascades has, you know, become much more dynamic. If you look, if you go back to that pre-2000 even era, I mean, we could look a little further back, but the the way water, wet, dry cycles came into the basin was a relatively, um, it was almost a perfect curve between wet and dry cycles over a 20-year period. So we would be, you know, really wet, and we'd go through a period of dry, and then we'd cycle back into a really wet year, you know, Every 10 years, it was going up and down through this this wet, dry cycle in a perfect 20-year period. And now we're seeing that's much more dynamic, where one year you have, you know, 120, 130% of snowpack, and the next year you have these exceptionally low snowpacks and, you know, 70 and 80. And so you don't have any predictability or any reliability of even what's coming off of the mountains. And so... When, when I try to look across at the other stakeholders that are trying to manage water as well, I have to keep that in mind because they've got to divvy that water out. You know, the water allocations were based on on historical and legal requirements and, and how it gets laid out was based on a system that's not necessarily working as well from a climatic standpoint as it did 20 and 30 and 40 years ago. So as complex as it is and as, as many moving parts as there are, is there a simple answer of how to get the Klamath Basin Refuge water that it needs to become to stay that place where ducks breed. I mean, the California mallard population depends on this area for breeding and nesting. The mallard population in California is down. It's being affected by that all over the Butte Sink or the rice country. Um, there, like I mentioned before also, John, is that there's a ton of wildlife that's affected by this. Is there a simple answer of like, here's the deal, we need water. The federal government, are they, you know, I know that the Trump administration has been saying some things that there is going to be some money and funds allocated to this. But the bottom line is, is that this is a huge part of this area, this flyway, this ecosystem. It sounds to me or it seems to me like the simplicity of this is, look, no matter what it takes, this refuge is the most important part of all this. Or is that hard to say? Because then you have all of these different revenue streams that are being affected. It just seems to me like even the salmon fishermen or the reservation and the tribes, everybody's, I think that the one common goal would be to get this refuge back and healthy of where it was at one time. Yeah. Yeah. I I think you're right. The answer is simple, you know, for the basin, for all the issues in the, the basin, I think the answer is simple, you know, water, We need to figure out the water issues. Um, You know, if we could solve the water issues for everybody, it would become really simple for the refuge. But that's where the complexity comes in is that the, the water availability has changed from that climatic standpoint. And that's where the rub comes in. That's where the complexity comes in. Um, I, I wish it was as simple as, you know, we, we know what the refuge needs to run. We know what the refuge needs to function. We can, you know, we can, we can tell you, energetically what we can produce with any volume of water we get at any certain times of the year, but that simplicity isn't available yet. Um, and I wish it was, I I mean, I would make, that would make our life a lot easier, but it's, you know, I think bottom line, it comes down to that unpredictability and unreliability of what's happening every year, every year climatically is sort of the foundational issue. Um, you know, much, much harder to figure that one out for sure. Um, you know, the second tier of that would be, I think what you went to is finding that collaboration between that water that we know we have, you know, how do we get to a balance with that? I think that's where, um, you know, the conversation and, and the struggle, um, probably needs to come and will come here in the basin because you're right. I I think as, as a basin community, people value these refuges. You know, I don't think there's anybody in the basin that would say it would be a better basin if the refuges weren't here. But I think when you're talking about the other drivers that you talked about, you know, the the fisheries issues, the tribal fisheries issues, the agricultural issues, those are stakeholders that are greatly invested as well. And so how we have those conversations moving forward in a way that um, is collaborative and not a conflict, I think that's where the that's where it gets complex because we all want a solution, but it's getting to that solution. Okay. I was up here in September when the migration, there was kind of a little bit of an early migration this year. 
I watched ducks um, from from divers to teal to sprig to speckle belly geese and Canada geese moving into this area in September. The temperatures were getting into the 90s at night at at during the day, and they weren't getting below 50, 45, 50 at night. This, when I talked to you, was a recipe for disaster. So, this was in the Thule base, the Thule Wildlife Refuge, or the Thule Lake region. Um, Klamath was dry. There's very little water here at the time. The water levels are low, letting that sunshine get in there and create what becomes a botulism outbreak. I want to be educated on botulism. I know there's different forms of botulism. I'm really um, intrigued by botulism because I know people can get a certain strain of botulism. Um, some of the things that blew my mind is that a coyote could eat a duck affected by it, but not get affected by, you know, the, the or have those maggots in that coyote system and his digestive system or her digestive system handles it. Um, 50, 60,000 dead ducks. You could correct me on that. We are, my boat picked up 320 that day, plus about 40 live ones that we rushed to bird alley X that I want to talk about too. They get these, but these ducks rehabilitated and get them back into the wild. But this right here is enough 50 to six. I'm not saying that botulism hasn't occurred. I know that it does, but it's going to keep occurring in this area with the water levels being where they're at. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I think that that's fair to say. Yeah. When we have, you know, botulism is a tricky one because it's in the soil. And once you have it in the soil, it never goes away. So you, you know when the conditions are right, you're going to get a botulism outbreak. But I think the issue, the bigger issue that is important to talk about is that, you know, what happened this year is tied directly to what you were leading to earlier is that lack of water. And so when you have, you know, one or two wetlands on the landscape, and that's the only place that all those birds coming out of the Central Valley and all those local birds had to go to molt. If that one wetland gets an outbreak, you're gonna you're stacking the odds towards a really high outbreak. And so, to me, the the issue that we have here in the basin is there's not enough other places to spread the birds out. You know, so if if Thule Lake hadn't been holding two hundred thousand birds going into that, it was holding closer to you know sixty seventy thousand would the outbreak have been that bad because the birds would have been spread out a little bit further? Or if we had them in other wetlands that weren't receiving or weren't dealing with an outbreak, we would have had a lot of birds that were here that did get subjected to the botulism outbreak in other places that they would have been safe. So the big issue is having enough of those wetland habitats on the ground for that early part of that late summer, early fall migration period you know, the late summer for those molters coming out of the Central Valley, because that is such a key population for the state of California. Um, <clears throat> you know, like you said, California, their population has gone down dramatically. So any birds that we lose, you know, what they can produce there, and then they come up here and die from botulism. That's, that's pretty devastating to what they're trying to accomplish from the Central Valley population. But the other side of that is that early migration. And the, it's twofold. You know, we're not... Those birds that we did attract then came to one wetland that was infested with, with botulism. But then how many other birds did we just send right past the Klamath Basin, which was historically, you know, the main staging area in the Pacific Flyway for water birds. I mean, we, we would stage 80% of the, the fall population here. And now those birds that late August, early September, they're just flying right by the basin, ending up in Central Valley way too early. You know, and that has effects as well from a, a bird standpoint in terms of, you know, how fast are they going to go through that food? Um, how much water's on the landscape? Is there going to be depredation issues associated with it? So that spring, late, late summer, early fall water is key to not only botulism, but to that population management for the Pacific Flyway as well. So when you... When you sit here as the advice, you know, the supervisory biologist and you have, to, and you're also a very passionate duck hunter, you love ducks, you love water, you love all kinds of birds, shorebirds, everything. This is what you were educated in. This is where your love and passion was the compassion. I don't know how many times or how many tears I shedded that day or how many times I cried, but just the emotional part of that. And again, it's all, it's easy to say, oh, it's mother nature. It's the ecosystem. It's the, it's how the card, you know, the cookie crumbles, you know, it's the survival of the fittest. These ducks don't stand a chance. These migrating birds were coming into this, this basin 
which is imprinted in their minds. This is an ancestral imprinted hole for a lot of these species of the waterfowl variety, which is the main reason I'm talking about waterfowl is because of the migration. They're going, we're going to Klamath. We're stopping there along the way on our way down to the Central Valley or our way down to, you know, the Salton Sea or wherever they end up in California, the Pacific Flyway. How, what's going on when they're overhead? And we saw this. I watched migrating birds come in that day. What happens? They, they, they see there's birds out on the big water. There's also boats out there picking up these dead ducks. There's dead ducks and there's live ducks that are crippled and paralyzed. Paralysis is setting in and we're going and netting them and getting them up. But at the same time, there's new birds coming into that water source. You cannot stop. You can't build a net over it. No. So now they go in there and what happens? They eat, a, they, they eat a maggot or they drink the water or what, what, how does that next flock get it? It generally is the maggots. Yeah. So the birds come in and they, you know, they land in an area that's got a concentration of, of birds and, you know, when you think about what a duck is going through that time of year, you know, whether it's late summer, or early fall, they're just, they're either coming out of that molt migration or they're going into their next, their next molt. <clears throat> so they need protein. And so you, you know, if you're a duck and you're floating down the shoreline and you see this big mass of maggots floating on the water, it's a huge food resource. And so they go right for it. And, and a lot of, you know, most of it does come from that ingestion of the maggots, but you can get some levels of bioaccumulation in just the invertebrates in the, in the wetland itself. But it's, it's primarily the maggots that drive it because they just, they're molting and they need protein. So how does the first duck get botulism in an area? Because does he eat a maggot or the maggots already in the water or do the maggots congregate once they see fresh dead duck meat out there or they get on, they smell it, they get on maggots usually will get on that meat. And you, you've seen it. Even if you have, you know, pork, pork chop bones in a bag, they can attract maggots if you leave them in the wrong place. So how does that first duck get it? Is it, does he eat a maggot? Does she eat a maggot when the water levels are that low? Are the maggots being produced in the soil? Uh, because you said botulism starts in the soil. Once it's there, it's always there. You can't get rid of it. How does that first duck in a 2020 botulism outbreak become infected? Yeah, so the, the botulism bacteria is in the soil. And so when you get the conditions, it, it needs anaerobic conditions. So it likes low oxygen conditions for it to, to stimulate its life cycle, to start functioning. And so when we see those, like you mentioned, those temperatures at 90 degree days, 50 degree nights, that's where we're starting to get low water levels and l not much dissolved organic or dissolved oxygen in the, the water column. And so that bacteria starts to go through its bacterial phase or, you know, its life cycle. As it's doing that, it, it has, the, it produces the, the toxins, a byproduct of that cycle of the bacteria going through it. And it needs a protein source. So if there's a dead fish on the water, or you got a bunch of rotting vegetation, or you have um, a lot of invertebrates on the shoreline, that protein source is enough to get that bacteria to start its cycle. And so if, you know, even like a fish carcass, if there's maggots on that and a duck comes by, that becomes case number one, and then it just bio, bio magnifies, And the, the toxin, you know, it's a toxin that, that kills the birds. It's not a disease, it's a toxin. And that toxin lives in invertebrates, you know, that cycle is in invertebrates. So it's kind of a, you know, it's, it's a bad thing for ducks when you need invertebrates, you know, that's your food resource and that's where this toxin is, is hiding out in. How, uh, before we go to how the botulism is killed or it goes away, cause now it's colder, mm -hmm. the ducks aren't being affected by it anymore this time of year, but just a couple months ago they were, what happens to the duck? What does it go? Because you know, if you, if I, if I could describe this right, if a duck hunter is listening to this, he or she, if you've seen a crippled pintail, once you shoot it and it's out in the water and sometimes, you know, they're, you could tell that they're hit and their heads are just bobbing left and right. You've seen it. The dogs are swimming at them and they're, they can't do anything about it. They're done, but they're not dead yet. When I saw these ducks, you'd see a little ripple on the water. They're moving a little bit and their heads were doing the same thing. They had no control of their, their skeletal system, their muscular system. It was like, Paralysis was setting in. So once that duck, female or male, is infected by botulism, what does what does that duck experience? Yeah, so it, it moves relatively fast. You know, it, it hits them, and they start to, you know, get minor paralysis. Generally, you start to see it in the wings or the legs or the neck. You know, so you'll, like you said, you'll see their neck kind of wobbling or their head wobbling, or you'll see them sort of steaming across the water, um, not able to fly. And then as, you know, it the paralysis goes further and further. They just lose all, all um, muscle function. 
And ultimately what kills the birds is they drown, which is just, you know, horrible to think of from a standpoint of these are water birds and they're, they're out there drowning. Um, but that's generally what, what the cause of death is, is drowning. Or, you know, a lot of times they'll get up, um, you know, they, they try to, they try to find cover like in tules and stuff to get cooled down cause they get hot out there. Um, but a lot of times they get exposed out on those mud flats and they just die from heat exhaustion as well. But, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's not pleasant at all. You know, like you mentioned, it's a, Is it's it a painful thing to experience. I, I, I couldn't you can't speak tell. Yeah, I couldn't speak You can't really get it. Like if a dog's in pain, you can tell. Yeah. So the ducks that were saved by your efforts and Mike McVeigh's efforts and California Waterfowl Association's efforts and had a lot of volunteers up here on, on, on airboats, netting these ducks, putting them in crates and getting them over to bird, bird alley X. Um, what saves the duck? How is this? Is this a what is this? This is a um, is it what is botulism considered? Is so it's it, a toxin. It's a toxin. It's a toxin. So <laughs> is it a is there a cure? Is it like a vaccination? Could a duck have like we're talking through, during Corona right now? Could you go when you're doing a banding initiative? Could you is there a botulism vaccination that would prevent a duck from getting this or and then what is the cure for it once they are saved and they're still alive and you get them somewhere like Bird Alley X and their makeshift hospitals? Yeah, as far as I know, there is there's no cure at all. I mean, there's no no uh, vaccine. Vaccine. There is an antitoxin that you can give them when when they have it. Um, you can hit them with that antitoxin or, you know, and it's just like rattles, you know, if your dog gets bit by a rattlesnake, you can give them the anti-venin. It, it helps turn it around. Um, so you can, you can administer that antitoxin and help them. Um, but the primary thing that you have to do for the birds is get them hydrated, you know, get, get water going through their system, flush the, the toxin out of the system. And depending on what stage of, of the toxin poisoning they're in, you know, that could be anything from a couple days of just getting fluids and a flushing of the of water um to needing different uh, vitamins and, and different antibiotics but um boy I, I i know nothing about the rehab other than you know the work that that focus and bird allies did for us was just amazing this year but um, i'm not an expert in the rehabbing at all so how does that happen? How does somebody like Bird Alley X get, do you know about their services because you're in this line of work? Do they market their services? And, and it's a volunteer chair, uh, donations only. That's how they survive. That's how they pay their people to, to do this. And what they do, like you said, is amazing work. How do you hear about Bird Alley X and how does that come about that they come and set up? The, I mean, it was like MASH. It was like this makeshift hospital set up for like they would do in war, you know, when, when our veterans are over fighting for our freedoms or our, our active duty are over there fighting, they get wounded, they go to a makeshift hospital on a base. That's what this was for wounded ducks, for, for sick ducks and geese. How, how, how does that come about? Yeah, so fortunately, I mean, that's kind of an odd story. Um, so the, the ladies that you met in the hospital, um, one of them lives here in the local community. And so, she, you know, she had heard about what we had going on and, and offered – um, several years ago to help us, um, to look at what we were doing and to give us some ideas on, on upgrading the hospital. And in, in doing that, um, for the, the first year, um, her and, and some other folks volunteered to, to help out in the hospital and, and get it up to speed. And so then we realized that, um, you know, we couldn't handle that as a staff. So we put that out to contract, um, and it was bid on by Focus Wildlife, who is another wildlife rehabilitator that does work up and down the Pacific Flyway. And then they contracted local people that you met to help out with, with that. Um, and, you know, they, there's other different bird organizations. But, yeah, we were just lucky to have January living here in the local community. And she wrote the book on, on water bird rehabilitation. So it was, you know, just lucky that she January's was January's from this area. Yeah, she lives here in Clamp. What a cool name. Yeah, yeah. She yeah. is awesome. Yeah, she's amazing. And just the care and the compassion she has to have for animals to do that. Yeah. But she's also a hunter. I no, she does not hunt. She does not hunt. <laughs> no, no, her family does, but she doesn't hunt. I thought she told me she hunted before. She might have done it, but I don't think she does now. Did yeah. you see the article that came out in Wildfowl yeah. about it? What did you think of it? I thought it was great, yeah. I, did they know. interview you for that? No, nope, I wasn't interviewed for that. Because of the the approval or what? Yeah, yeah. Um, you don't have to answer this, but why does it take so long to get approval on something? Back to our beginning of this conversation, John, is that this is important. 
Why does it take the federal government so long to approve something that needs to be talked about, that needs to be to fix this deal? Yeah, I probably can't talk about that. Yeah, I don't think I can talk about that. So there's no answer for why it would take that long to get approved? No, I mean, it, it's just the, the Klamath is a, it's a hot, it's a touchy situation. Yeah, it's a contentious area. Yeah. It's crazy. It's so crazy to yeah. me that that, I mean, it seems so easy to say that's it's got to be fixed. Yeah, it's got to be fixed. And so hopefully this, you know, what these rumors of what's going on right now and what Rocky Merlo and those guys have been, you know, working on what yourself and people have been hoping for is maybe it's maybe there's some good news in the future, you know, some good vibes coming for the area. So botulism is going on all the way until when I was here in September. When did it go away? This outbreak lasted from about the first week of July to mid mid October. Um. And it, to stop botulism, you need that maggot cycle to stop. And so, you know, we normally look at once we start to get frost that the maggot cycle is going to end. But this year we would get cold at night and then we'd get up to 60 during the day and it never killed the flies. And so it just continued on and on and just would not end. It was, I mean, we were, we were, we had sump one be closed early. We were picking birds up the day before we opened uh, some one beat a hunting because there was still, you know, lots of lots of birds out there, and you know, not as many being affected, but but still fresh cases every day, and that was, you know, October twentieth somewhere in there. Wow! So after opening day, yeah, yeah, it was it, it lasted forever. It was horrible. And do you know a number that was picked up? We picked up, you know, the the official count was somewhere around twenty five to twenty eight thousand that we we picked up. Um, you know, and then we generally, you know, and that was, we had a lot of birds in sump one B going into, you know, sump one A, we picked up right around 20,000. And then when we finally got into sump one B, when the water come up and came up enough that we could run boats out there, um, you know, and just, we went out there two days in a row for an hour and a half, you know, after the end of shooting time. So we weren't disturbing the birds. And each day we picked up over 2000 birds in that that hour of time, an hour and a half of time. And then, then it opened. And once it opened, we couldn't be out there, you know, causing more disturbance to the birds after the, the hunt closed. So you assume it's over at that point. It's more cosmetic getting the birds out, but, um, but there were still cases happening up until the end. Why get them out? It sounds like a dumb question, but is it because there's a ton of maggots on those birds and the more birds you get out of there that have already infected or dead, killed by botulism, you get them out of there because you're removing all the maggots that's in that duck? Yeah, so it's, you know, the science is really, um, there's a wide range of thoughts on botulism cleanup, you know, ranging from, you know, you should do 100% everything you can to get every bird out of the system to you should just leave them and let nature take its course. And that really depends on what kind of system you're talking about. So um, most of the time, you know, the experts that we talk to say, if we feel like we're, we're getting a really good cleanup, we're getting, you know, well over 50% of the birds out of the system, then you are removing to a certain degree that, that maggot biomass that's out there, you know, those carcasses that are producing more and more maggots. But when the cover starts to get really thick and your detection rate declines, you know, to where you're not finding the birds, you're just, you might be causing more disturbance that's actually, you know, causing more stress to the bird and and not causing the positive effects that you'd like to. So um, we we try to on, you know, like you saw some point A, it's relatively open. When the water was down, you could be pretty confident that you were seeing most of the birds that were affected and, and getting a good cleanup. So we we've prioritized that, trying to get the maggot cycle down and and get the toxin out of the system. But you know, sometimes you just can't, you can't access them or you can't find them. So if a hawk or a bird of prey, an eagle, golden eagle, bald eagle is flying over this unit, first off, does it attract more birds of prey when this happens? Does, does it bring in more of that type of thing? You start to see more coyotes around the area because they start to smell at the, obviously coyotes on scent, but visually are these birds of prey say, seeing it? Because I, I, I thought I had been told by you or somebody that, Average wise around here, historically, there's not a lot of birds of prey around. Is that true? Yeah, at this time, or, you know, in the summer during the botulism, we don't have a lot of the eagles. They're just not here yet. They, that's a, that's more of a wintering thing. 
and a lot of the other raptors we have aren't necessarily interested in waterfowl. Um, you know, the falcons that are going after waterfowl aren't picking up carrion, so we don't have as we don't have those issues with a lot of the birds of prey. Um, some of the red tails and stuff will pick up, you know, carcasses when they find them, but you just don't see the the raptor base that we have here in the summer really keying in on those carcasses. The mammals we do for sure. I mean, you definitely see the coyote populations going up around the sump and the the um, raccoons. You start to see a lot of them, but with the the cholera, which is the other waterfowl disease that we tend to see in the winter, you know, any time from now till um, spring, that definitely that's a that's a driver of eagle populations. Um, you know, when when we had the really high eagle populations in the Klamath Basin. That was when we had really high waterfowl populations, and with really high waterfowl populations, there's, you know, more mortality from cholera, and so those eagles were just keyed in on, on coming and feeding on cholera birds. So if an eagle eats a carcass of a dead duck that was d- killed by botulism that has maggots on it, does that eagle get botulism? As far as I know, no, but don't quote me on that. You know, I'm not an expert on the, but def, you know, it's, from what I've read, it's definitely more focused on the aquatic birds. This strain of botulism, we have the the, the toxic. Wow, that's sea. crazy that a bird yeah. of prey that is still, you know, has kind of the same makeup <laughs> as far as, yeah. you know, the skeletal system of a duck or a goose, you know, size-wise. What if they land in the water and eat the maggots out of the water? They're just stopping for a drink. Do you Have you heard of eagles or anything getting botulism? I, I have not heard of any of those getting botulism, you know, but... You know, we tend to see them feeding on the carcasses and not on, on the maggots. And the maggot cycle seems to be worse. You know, when you take the carcass and you get it out into the drier areas and you've removed it from all the flies that are there, it doesn't seem like the, the maggot cycle. You don't see them as much on those drier carcasses as you do out in the wetland. So it could be a function of that or it could just be we don't have birds that are targeting in on on carcasses that time of year. I don't know. Um, but when you, you know, we have even different water bird species don't get the strain that these birds were getting. Other ones get, I think it's toxin E, which is, they get more from fish. So that's when you start to see mergansers and cormorants and, um, you know, the diving birds get that strain of, of botulism. And these birds tend to get the, I think it's C, um, botulism C. When, when you start talking about the water again in all of the different areas where water is being pulled from, not pulled from to fill this place, but people are pulling from all different directions to get the water that's in this area. Is it, is it something that the water levels of where the folks around here are hunting this year, because this is a hunter's paradise, huge mule deer, huge antelope, elk, not far from here, unbelievable waterfowl hunting here, historically dry land hunting, you know, as far as getting ducks and weed or corn in this area, it's unbelievable. I've seen it just, the goose hunting can be amazing here with, the hunting that's going on right now in this area, there's nothing going on in Klamath, southern, southern Klamath. There's nothing going on in that in that refuge at all. No, there's a little, a few guys are targeting, you know, dry land geese when they when they can get them on a pattern. But for the most part, I mean, there's there's one small little area that's got some birds that they're flying out to other areas, and there's some dry field feeding going on. But it's it's almost zero. I would, I mean, I would for say Klamath. zero. Yeah, for Lower Klamath. Yeah. So the the hunting in this area is taking place at Thule. Mm-hmm. What's the water levels at Thule like right now? Thule, we're, we're low. I mean, it, it looks... Um, it looks big it and looks, vast. Yeah, it looks big and vast. But, um, you know, so going through the summer, we actually, you know, before we, we realized it was going to be a bad drought year, we had planned on doing a drawdown on Sump 1B. And I think you guys have been out hunting on Sump 1B. And... You know, these wetlands, you know, they're they're wetlands because they go dry. If they don't go dry, they become lakes. So wetlands have to go dry at some point during their life cycle. And so we will do managed drawdowns when we can. And so Sump 1B had went through a managed drawdown this year, and that stimulates a lot of the seasonal plants that the birds really need, the smart weeds, um, goosefoot, pigweed, the things that you were seeing out there, all the red weeds that you were probably hunting in. Um, you know, so that had went dry intentionally and we didn't expect we'd have the drought conditions we had this year we might have looked at doing it another year but we didn't expect 1a to go as low as it did and so when you know 1a dropped down to um it was probably a foot to a foot and a half below its its normal summer summer levels which is 
probably in part why we got the, ex you know, that was why we had the exposed mud and the botulism that blew up. Um, so going into the fall, we had this really productive wetland, Sump 1B, completely dry, that almost all of our duck food is in. And then we have some, some grain fields to flood with very little water in the system. So what we opted to do was pull the water, as much of the water as we could within um, the constraints that we, we were obligated to um, based on the, the ESA limitations for suckers in the sump. We, we pulled it down as low as we could to move that water to other areas that had better food resources. Um, so the, it looks wet, um, but compared to years when I'm normally managing Thule Lake, I would have sump 1A completely full right now, sump 1B completely full. You know, I might have 800 to 1,000 acres of grain flooded um, out in the, the lease lands. Um, so we're, we're a lot drier, even on Thule, than we have been in previous years, you know, even though it does get a little bit more reliable water deliveries. I don't know if you've already told me this, but when you take that into consideration, plus the lower Klamath Basin being dry, what percentage of birds are here right now that should be here on a normal year? And, and when was that last normal year to where you went? Have you seen it in your tenure here? And in your predator, the guy that you, the one that was here before you, what was his name? Dave Mauser. Dave Mauser. When Dave was here, did he talk about what the good old days were? How many birds were people used to seeing here? How many birds are here right now? And I assume that a lot of birds just fly over the place. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so it's, for me to put it into perspective, we always go back to, especially when we're talking about Thule Lake, um, we go back to sort of 1950. And 1950 is when um, Thule Lake, as it looks now, was sort of set in place. So the, the two big sumps were finally established. Um, the agricultural footprint was finalized. Um, there was still homesteading going on, you know, in and around the Thule Lake area. But for the most part, the land looks like it does now. And Lower Klamath, on the other hand, you know, drought, Lower Klamath has been dry before. Um, in the 1920s, it went completely dry, um, you know, due to similar issues that they changed the hydrology of the system and Lower Klamath went dry. But in the 1930s and 40s, they, f they figured out a system to move water from Thule Lake through the ridge here, Sheepy Ridge. There's a big tunnel that goes through it that they can pump water over to, to, to Lower Klamath. And that's how they re-flooded lower Klamath and it came back. So that 1950s time period sort of is when things were the best they could have been here for the basin under the, the new footprint, you know, the new footprint that we have on the landscape from, you know, ag and cities and, you know, everything else that we have going on here. And populations at that point, we would see annual peaks between the two refuges in the six to nine, or six to seven million bird range between those two refuges. And in the 1950s, most of the, Thule Lake was the big driver of the populations. Um, a lot of pintails came to Thule Lake and, and staged on Thule Lake. And then there was a really cool exchange between Thule Lake, birds would fly over the ridge and, and go to Lower Klamath. There was a big hunting tradition here of guys standing up on Sheepy Ridge here and pass shooting birds going between the two refuges. Um, but that changed dramatically because, you know, as a, you hunt all over the place, you know, the thing that drives wetlands is productivity, you know, and productivity is driven by the wet and dry cycle of the wetland. So when they stabilized Thule Lake, it stopped being a wetland to a certain degree. It became a lake. It didn't go through those big up and downs, those big wet dry cycles that a wetland needs to go through to stay, to stay really um, productive. And so we lost our emergent vegetation and we lost, importantly, the submergent vegetation, the sago pondweed and the widgeon grass. That's what drove, that was the, the energetic foundation of these wetlands. Um, so by the 1970s, that population, um, we had dropped down to, you know, between two and three million birds was sort of the peak in the 1970s. And then that stabled off you know, and stayed right around 2 million for the, lo the longest time from 70s on. But importantly, numbers really increased on Lower Klamath. Lower Klamath became way more important than Thule Lake beginning in the 1970s and definitely in the 80s to 90s. Um, the population really shifted to Lower Klamath. So, you know, as that population shifted, that's about when things started to get bad again for Lower Klamath, when the water 
reliability started to change. And, you know, by the 90s, water reliability um, had really changed for Lower Klamath. So in, in Dave's time, he talks about coming up here as a student from Humboldt and having this amazing waterfowl resource that they could come up here and hunt when they were skipping classes or in between tests um, to when he did his PhD work on nesting mallards, you know, having this great mallard, mallard nesting population to when he left, you know, kind of the conditions that I inherited. Um, you know, these really um, decreased wetlands, really decreased waterfowl numbers. Um, you know, so to put that his history in perspective, this year, the last survey I was able to fly was November 2nd. And then we were, all of our surveys have been shut down with COVID because of, you can't have two people in a plane. So um, these areas are too big to survey from the ground. So we don't have any surveys from our surveys. 2nd. Would they be important right now? They'd be really important. So yeah. you can't take a, each, somebody's temperature and get it clear that either neither one of you have COVID to go and take care of this issue. No, we're we're from this from the service standpoint, we can't be in the air flying surveys right now. That's feds or state? That's both. Yeah, both feds and state are shut down right now. So there's no surveys going mm -hmm. on in the breeding grounds or anywhere nothing. on the prairie. Nothing. Nothing's going on. Yeah, yeah. So November second was the last survey I was able to get flown, um, and. Between the two refuges, we were under 110,000 birds. I want to get this right, though. You can have a full jetliner full of people with masks on that don't get their temperature taken. Nobody knows they got COVID or not. They're sitting three to an aisle. Some of these airlines have the middle seat open. But the federal government will not let biologists go up two at a time in a prop plane to survey this important factor of our ecosystem. Yeah, we're not. We're, we're grounded. Right That's now. crazy. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy to me. Like there's no, I, I don't understand how they can make sense in their own minds. Like that just, that's the kind of things that, that are affecting this as a whole, that we need to, those studies and those numbers and those surveys being done. Yeah. It's I, calculations of what's really happening here. Yeah. And I mean, I, I, I can't speak to you the can't determinations speak on, around it. it, but you know, I know from, you know, our regional leadership's perspective, I mean, it's definitely safety, safety of staff is the priority right now. Um, you know, so some of these things that we traditionally do just, just aren't happening. You know, we were really fortunate to at least be able to be out and, and work the work the botulism cleanup because there was a lot of staff at that time that, you know, couldn't be in the field and we were allowed to to get a waiver to be out doing that. So, yeah, I mean, I, I can't speak to, you know, how they make the decisions. You know, that's that's not at my level. But I know that safety of the staff is paramount to the leadership right now. I understand that. Yeah. I understand that 100%. And I don't take that for granted. I'm not ignorant to it, but it just seems if it's two healthy biologists that get their temperatures taken, they don't have any symptoms of this COVID, that they could go up and do their job. But uh, again, that's neither here nor yeah. there. That's something that you have no control of. Right. But where do we go from here? Yeah. Where, where so, do we go from here with the state of the lower Klamath? Um, talk to me a little bit about this. I want you to tell me where we go from here. But Organizations like California Waterfowl, the the task force that Rocky Merlo has been so instrumental in putting together. Where where does this sit with you as a very educated asset and and source of information in this situation? Where what where does that sit with you? How do you, how do you look at an organization like CWA, this task force that's been put together by Merlo and the other p people on the board? Um, is they're obviously allies. Yeah. Is it a waste of time? Is this effort, is this something that needed to be done? Did it get you fired up to see that it was being done? And what does CWA and people and, and, and allies like Rocky Merlo and his, his team of people that he's got with him as the chairman of the board right now, what does that make you feel inside as the, in the position you're in right now? Oh, I mean, it's, yeah, it makes me, I mean, I, I couldn't be happier that we have those kind of advocates on the landscape, you know, um, as it, working for the federal government, there's only, you know, there's things we can and there's things we can't do. And, and our expertise is is definitely working on the ground and, and dealing with the management issues on the ground. And so having stakeholders that are invested in us is amazing. You know, and, and CWA has, they have stepped up and, you know, they've, they've done a ton of homework understanding the issues and understanding the challenges of the basin. And they've done a really good job in you know, from my perspective and balancing out that they're an organization that's definitely passionate about waterfowl, but they understand the landscape has a, has a bunch of stakeholders that their central focus may not be waterfowl. So they've done a really good job, I think, about understanding that landscape, being able to 
um, work with those different stakeholders, engage those different stakeholders, like you said, through the, the task force. That task force is made up with a pretty diverse group of people when you look at the stakeholders of the basin. But the one central point is they really love these refuges and these wetlands and they want to see something change. And so, yeah, it's, it's tremendously inspiring for me to see all these people coming together, um, fighting for this issue. You know, I'm, if, if we can't get behind waterfowl and wetlands as a, you know, a, a hunting community and a, and a conservation community, you know, we're in a, we're in a pretty bad spot. So, you know, I, I can't say enough. I can't say enough thanks to all these groups that are doing this, this type of work. John, they say, don't take your work home with you. Leave it at the office. Don't let it affect your family time, your, your, your fatherhood time, your, your husband time, your motherhood time. If you're a woman, leave it there, yeah. turn it off. I almost got like a glimpse that it, it, like you do, or you are very personally affected by the state of this place. Like it's your, it's your baby um, in a way. Uh, maybe that sounds tacky. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but I saw like a glimmer, like a, like a negative glimmer in your eye of that. You really are affected by this person. You, you lay awake at night. Does it affect you to see all those dead birds and botulism hit? Does it affect you to see this area of this, this land that you love so much, the tourism affected, the revenue streams affected shops and hotels and stores closing down bars and restaurants closing down because hunters can't support it. Could you imagine the Canadian prairies? If we weren't allowed to go to Canada every starting in September and maybe spring bear hunts, but go up there for the waterfowl season, the fishing season, Americans aren't allowed to cross the border. We're, you know how many how much revenue is lost by these prairie towns, not just the outfitters, but I don't know how many hotel rooms I've booked in Canada and how much gas I've pumped and how many beers we've bought, and how much restaurant money we've spent. Um, how affected are you personally to see this place that you love so much and these animals affected that you love so much? How, what does it do to you personally? Yeah, it's, it's, it's tough. I mean, to, you know, if I can step back, I guess a little bit, I, I mean... You know, growing up, I think you're probably a little bit younger than me, but growing up, when when I was a kid, 10 years old, every Ducks Unlimited magazine had a story about the Klamath Basin in it. And that's where I wanted to be. You know, this is like, this is the dream job. You know, I wanted to go to school, be a wetland manager, waterfowl biologist, and work in the Klamath Basin. And going through college, the case examples you talked about, you know, for waterfowl management was the Pacific Flyway, the Klamath Basin. And to get here and and see it not be that, it yeah, it's 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 tough, you know, because I I love to manage wetlands, love to manage ducks. And uh so I, I do. I want things to change around. I want you know, I tell all the hunters, I I'm not gonna be happy until we see four million birds back in the Klamath Basin again. That's what we we know we can do it. You know, so I'm, I'm, yeah, it affects me. I think about By when? It. I'd like to see it next year, but. <laughs> so can the federal I, government just call you and say, hey, you're going, to, you're going to another refuge up in North Dakota. You're gone. Do they pull you out of here? How does that work? Well, I hope not, but. Uh, no, but what I'm saying, <laughs> is that how the job works? Can they just replace you? Or is it something to where this is a, a, a job to where it's yours until you retire? How does, how does that work real quick? Yeah, I mean, for, for my series, the biology series, I mean, we tend to be a much more stable part of the workforce. Um, you know, historically, uh, refuge managers moved around a lot. Biologists tend to be a little bit more stable, and the guys that work in the field um, tended to be the most stable. You know, so a lot of the institutional knowledge is in the guys that, you know, they're out there doing all the field work for us. Um, but, you know, I think... You know, in my career, I spent 10 years at my last duty station, which was in New Mexico. And, you know, my my dream would be to finish out my career here in the Klamath Basin. Um, so know, are so. you judged on a value performance? Are you, do you, do they, do they give you reviews? Are you do like, if, can they come at you and say, wow, botulism, wow, tourism and revenues down. Wow. Hunting licenses are down. Wow. The harvest is down. Do they look at you? I mean, how are you? How can you be successful with this place in the state that it is? How can you ever show that you're kicking ass at your job? And I'm not saying that, that you, ne that you're, you know, I'm not asking you to judge your work. I'm just saying like, how does your, your bosses, the people that make these decisions 
could they ever come at you and say, man, this, this place is in terrible shape when you're doing everything that you can, how does that work? Right. I, mean, I can't, I don't think I could answer that. I don't know. You know, I, you know, how our performances judge is outside of those limitations, but, um, you know, I mean, I, I can just say personally how I feel about it. You know, I mean, I, yeah, I, I don't feel like I'm, I feel like there's a lot more we could do. I could do, um, you know, with, with the right resources, there's a ton of things we could do. We could turn this place around. So tell me how we can help. Tell me every one of these trucks with a boat on it, these guys that are boating in, they're walking into some of the sumps, mm -hmm. a, 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 a hunting license holder up here with the recreation pass. This is a 105 day season. You can hunt until one o'clock. There's a, a lot of good times to be had up here. It can't go away. This place could be unbelievable from dry field hunting to Canada goose hunting, probably some specs once in a while, but a lot of, a lot of different puddle ducks come through this area with some cans and different ring necks mm -hmm. and the diver variety. What can that every day or that weekend warrior duck hunter do to get involved, to help save this place and get it back to where your goal of 4 million birds can become viable and it can become within reach. Do they join CWA? Do they support CWA and, and, and get that yearly membership at 35 bucks and put that decal on their truck? Do they become a life member? What can they do? Do they write their Senator? Do they write their assemblyman? What can we do as duck hunters to help John Vradenberg? <laughs> yeah, you got it. <laughs> Vradenberg help you in your mission to get this place back to where you've seen it and where you want it to be again. Yeah. So from our perspective, from the, you know, from the Fish and Wildlife Service, I guess what I would say is, um, I think the most important thing people need to do is get educated on this place. You know, um, this was one of the most critical, not, not only was this one of the most critical waterfowl areas in North America, definitely the most critical staging area in the Pacific Flyway. But this place is one of the foundational areas of our waterfowl legacy. I mean, this is, when you think of waterfowl hunting, you think of, you know, places like the Chesapeake Bay, you think of Central Valley, you think of the Klamath Basin. This place is a legacy foundation place. So get educated on it, know what's going on here and learn what's going on here. And then I would encourage them to, um, you know, reach out and, and join the NGOs. I, yeah, I can't say who or what they should, what they should join, but I would encourage them to get involved, you know, get involved with a group that, that matches their personality and matches their desires and, 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 you know, do what they can within that agency. Um, because yeah, together we can do a lot more, you know, the more people that are interested, the more, and I, I think, you know, I, I guess I go back to the education because, you have to really know the issues to understand the challenges. You know, that's, you know, early on in our conversation, we got caught up in the complexity of this place. And, you know, I, I think that's where a lot of the issues with the Klamath come from is that it is so complex and the stories are so diverse that you really have to be well-rounded and well-educated in the issues that are going on here to really fully understand the path forward, you know, and that's where I, I really applaud groups like CWA and Ducks Unlimited and those because they're doing that right now. They're, they're learning the story and, and telling the story. But that's what I would encourage your listeners to do is, you know, get involved however they feel is most appropriate for them and, and learn about this place because it's an important part of our history, not only from the history of conservation. I mean, like you said, this was the first waterfowl refuge ever established. You know, it wasn't the first refuge, but it was the first refuge established specifically for waterfowl. And importantly, at that time, it was the biggest refuge in the, you know, it was one of Roosevelt's biggest um, protections that he did, you know, for, from the, from that time period. So it was huge. It was very forward thinking. Those guys that were thinking about that at that time of year were just such visionaries. And it's our job to keep that vision going forward. I mean, I, 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 I hope we can we can bring it back because it's, it's a great word to place. use. Yeah. Visionaries. Let's get involved. Let's get them back to where they need to be. I'm Chad Billing. Thank you all so much for joining us. Jake, Tom, hit that button. This is 2AM Logic. The song is called My Foul Life. Bye.